Are you crime curious? iHeart Podcast has gathered the best true crime all in one podcast feed. iHeart True Crime Plus. It's packed with podcasts about unsolved murders, missing persons, organized crime, and more. So there's always something good to binge and share iHeart True Crime Plus subscribers also enjoy ad-free listening, early access to select episodes, and exclusive bonus content. Subscribe to iHeart True Crime Plus today, exclusively on Apple Podcasts. 13 Days of Halloween, Devil's Night. Do not leave your house. Do not answer the door if you hear a bump in the night. Do not go investigate. Season 3 of the horror fiction podcast presented in immersive 3D audio. Ah! Oh my god, he's gonna get left behind. <laughs> he's gonna spend the night out here. Starring Carter Rockwood. Are you kidding me? You know what night it is? Did you hear the radio? And Clancy Brown. There are things in the night that would love to get their bony hands on a boy like you. Listen to 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Howdy, everybody. Thank you for downloading this particular podcast, which means you are a supporter of the independent music scene and the independent train of thought that we are all connected to within punk, hardcore, indie rock, metal, whatever genre you want to apply that to. It all comes from small, sweaty rooms. And, uh, you know, usually people jumping on top of each other. Not always, but, you know, sometimes. But... The reason that I'm I'm putting that preamble is because uh, this is probably going to be a big episode because uh, this person looms large within the uh, independent skateboard community, and this is Jeff Rowley. I am so excited to have him on the show because, uh, I mean, I love him. (laughs) I, I always wished I could be a better skateboarder than I actually was. I, I could barely kickflip, uh, not even kickflip, I could barely ollie, let's be very clear. I could barely uh, accomplish that, but I always admired and really, 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 really loved skate culture, especially when you're talking about all of those mid to late 90s skate videos, your Welcome to Hells and everything else, misled youth, so much good stuff. And the thing that I always admired about Jeff's segments in those particular, not those particular videos, but in skate videos in general, is that he always had really, really good music. And I was like, this dude, you know, not only does he know what's up with music in general in regards to, you know, sort of punk hardcore stuff, but he definitely was, you know, next level deeper. And he always picked out really, really good songs to skate to. And then, um, you know, he he was in Tony Hawk Pro Skater and he broke into the, the mainstream world as it were, And I've just always been uh, very fascinated by him as an individual. So we got into it, and he was very, very excited to talk about Discord Records and, um, yeah, the UK punk scene, so many interesting places that we went. And he was so generous with his time, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because he didn't need to let me, a random person, duck into his text messages (laughs) via friend of the show, Big shout out to Andrew Cannon for putting these pieces together and making this happen. I am forever indebted to you, Andrew, for many different ways. But uh, yeah, thank you for that. He didn't, but Jeff did not need to uh, engage, but he did, and it was a great conversation. So you can always email the show, 100 words podcast at gmail.com, if you would not mind diving onto your platform of choice, specifically Apple Podcasts, to leave a review and or a star rating. Same thing can be said about Spotify. Leave a star rating on there. Helps the algorithm. But then also tell your friends, because that's the best way to spread this particular word. And also, uh, thank you to everybody who you know emailed, reached out on social media, and said, uh, you know, congratulations to 10 years. I appreciate those people for doing that. And even if you did not reach out, I appreciate you for consuming the podcast, whether it's regularly, semi-regularly, or once a year. I don't care. I'm glad you're engaged with this thing. So let's talk to Jeff Rowley about all of the things that are attached to his train of thought and the fact that music played such an integral part to his life. So here we go. Here's Jeff.
first became exposed to you uh, via the you know 411 video magazines. Uh, I myself was never a good skateboarder, but I loved the culture that was around it and the intersection between music and that culture. And while a lot of skaters were including, you know, sort of punk, hardcore DIY stuff in their video parts, I always was attracted to what felt like your deeper cuts <laughs> and choices. And if I can recall, I, I think you you were skating to a, uh, a Dag Nasty song in one of those videos. I'm... I'm going to guess that the songs that you chose for your segments and anytime you had that editorial control, you probably, it, there was a lot of thought put into that. Or was it just basically like, oh, I want something that's one of these bands. How did that process go? No, there was a lot, a lot of thought that went into all of that and a lot of experimenting with music. I mean, I'm from Liverpool, England, northwest coast of England. And Liverpool is a very much a musical city. You just grow grow up with it around you. It's almost it's a comedy city too, and people have very kind of outward kind of attitudes like that. And people sing on the streets. There's a lot of kind of busking and and mayhem. And then you have the whole Beatles and that back end. So I've always grown up with it just surrounding me, you know. And, and the awe of what the mu- like music created and what even the vision that the, the band the Beatles did to you know, make people think about music in that manner, that it can be an art form that can be visual. You can see it as well as you can hear it and things. That was always interesting to me, you know. And uh, I think, like, my, my father was a printer, right? So, like, the whole process of, like, making skateboards, once I saw how boards were made, I was, you know, the smell of the paints uh, and then watching the skate videos and just the music that I was hearing nowhere else. That's always been a part of my life, man. Like, I'm 46 years old, but since I started listening to music, it's not been mainstream music. Right. uh, Generally. And a lot of those kind of bands that I've been into were in skate videos since the dawn of time. So, you know, when I was in my first skate videos or first video parts, I didn't want to have music other people had. I wanted to have music that related to me at that period of time. Right. like I always look back at skate videos as you're, made, you're documenting uh, almost like a musician is documenting his albums. Um, so if you can think like that, like when we were making those first skate videos or I have some, some creative control over skate video parts that I had, I wanted it to be a, a, a reflection of, of my own creativity as well as my skating as well as my music choices, I suppose. Right. And so did you uh, – forgive my – I was going to say it's called music, right? Like all the yeah, Minor Threat and Fugazi and and Longfish and Rights of Spring uh, and Grey Matter and all of those bands and Dag Nasty. Um, so yeah, so I, I I already had that music kind of in mind. It was just a matter of finding the right songs for the right parts. I still use a lot of the same music now for video parts or for you know. So it's. It's, you know, a lot of there isn't just a flash in the pan kind of bit to it where it's music that we're trying to use music that nobody else is using. It's more of like music we think that is that freaking good, but like maybe we want to expose it to more people too. Yeah. Well, and I think that that was what is so awesome about the intersection of both, you know, skateboarding and punk and hardcore and everything, because so much of that bounced off of each other, where, you know, I mean, especially it's like if you're, at a skate park and you know people back in the day when people were you know playing music on a boombox or whatever and you were getting exposed to mixtapes and then vice versa where if you're at a show and you watch the opening band play like you're just learning so much through osmosis and you existing in the area and so i think that the documentation as you're putting it of this music on you know a a skate mixtape like that's going to open so many people's eyes to be like who what what band was that dag nasty like what is that i don't even know what that is my my first like exposure to music that i was you know took home and listened to quietly and privately was a cassette tape and it was music that my friend thought i'd like based on the tracks that i said i liked on skate videos and so he made a cassette tape not i don't think i even asked him to uh and he had black flag dinosaur junior descendants had the Sonic Youth, all the sister LP tracks on that. So that was like the first cassette tape. So I'd lay in bed, listen to both sides of that stuff. And it, and it made me, no joke, like when I was laying in bed thinking of skateboarding and thinking like what tricks I was going to learn, music just went with it. I was able to find the right like 
level of aggression through listening to that kind of music and listening to the lyrics that were written down, which were often a lot more meaningful, a lot more interesting than like pop music or popular culture music or music that you'd see all over the radio or television at that time, you know? So um, that was my first exposure to it uh, really. And when you, when you remember that, like I've always protected my skateboarding, like I've always felt the same way I do when I started, like, and I've always felt like it was one of the reasons why I've been able to do it for a prolonged period of time is because the thing that I deem precious about it, you can't touch it. It's personal. Right. right. And music's been along for that ride um, the whole time with it. Yeah. And I, I think that that, I like how you put that because it is anytime someone puts their whole heart into their passion and trying to make it their living, whatever that may mean, there is that idea that you could get uh, burnt out if you don't, like you said, keep that some of that space, you know, sacred or untouchable, because then it just becomes, you know, something you do as opposed to this thing that you strive for, you know? For sure. For sure. And music's always been a part of that. Like whenever I go to a next chapter of making a skate video, once I start skating, I can tell the pace of the way that I'm skating based on just the tricks I want to learn at that given time. And then a lot of times I use music along that journey like I have been right now. I just finished another full skate video part that's going to come out in a month or two. Um, and it's got some unique music in there that's unique sp- to this particular project. Um, so I've been working, you know, on kind of uh, so in the last year, finishing that video off and quite a lot of those tracks have been along for, this, for that ride, you know. I do find yeah. like, I go through periods where... You know, but I always come back to certain stuff. I always come back to Discord because I feel like it's very genuine music that was, you know, well written as well as musically unique, as you know, and as well as entertaining in, in a different manner. Like, if you've ever seen Longfish live and Daniel Higgs, I mean, uh, incredible, just a, a great ent- entertainer in a totally different way, almost like poetry on stage. And that, you know, and that's yeah, cool. no, that's really that, that drives it. Yeah, no, it's really cool. And uh, I'm going to bounce around here a little bit, but um, as a kid, you know, as you were growing up and like you said, you know, growing up in Liverpool and and your your parents in the house and everything like that, did you, I guess, for lack of a better term, have a a focus? Like, I mean, I know when skateboarding came into your life, that was pretty all consuming, but um, were, you know, did you care about school? Did you have any sort of career aspirations uh or was it basically just hey once skateboarding came in like that was my north star i was extremely athletic I, okay I did, I did cross-country running i played soccer for the school team and for the local team so i played saturday and sunday soccer uh, i played cricket the whole way through my whole school life my school cricket team I was only beaten twice in four years um we had an incredible record I wasn't very good at cross country running. I was okay at soccer and then I found skateboarding, but I was always very energetic as a kid. So I would say I, the focus was always wherever the, the energy was at. And for the longest that I can remember, it was on soccer, football, I'll call it what it is. Yep. Before, before I found skateboarding and I would lay in bed in that football kit with the ball until the morning came out, much like I did with a skateboard, I would sleep with my board or sleep in the skate shoes I had because I was so stoked on them. I just couldn't wait to stand on the board in the morning. Um, so, yeah, like definitely a very in- intense, I think, kid. Looking back, like now knowing myself being a little bit older and going through, you know, certain periods of life where you're a lot, you're afforded the chance to look at yourself in the mirror. And uh uh, like looking back, yeah, I was pretty, pretty intense probably as a kid. Sure. Um, well, you were, you were, you were focused. You were able to see what you're passionate about and you really just followed that. Yeah. 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 So I, I, but I liked school. I just, there were certain things, certain classes I liked. I just felt like they were trying to push too much in me too quick for where I was at. I was a slower learner, but I felt like I took it in co- quick, but I, I wasn't ready to, do the work right away. That makes sense. I felt, yeah. like, I still feel like that now, like looking back, like I feel like I was a slower developer. I'm 
you know, through into my teen years and into being like a young man and everything. And, uh, and that's just, that was just my trajectory. But looking back, it's easy to see now, you know, easy. Of course. And like you said, your introduction to independent music, I know was like the, the mixtape that, you know, had black flag descendants and everything like that. And, um, what, I mean, that, coming into your life and you not having any real context for, you know, what genres these bands were a part of, and you just maybe understood that they were maybe quieter or louder than the last one. How, what attracted you to it? Was it just the simple aggression and you felt like that really matched with your personality or was it something else? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, my mother, I, I definitely grew up in a very musical area. You know, I mean, I went to the same school as John Lennon. You know, I would, I was in my, I would ditch school on, in Strawberry Fields and walk along Penny Lane. And that was Quarry Bank High School. And that was the original name for the Beatles, which was the Quarry Man. And like, so if you go to a school like that, you look at the influence that a guy like that had on the world, you know, I think. And it just opens your mind a little bit. Like, I'm thankful I grew up in that area. It's a very creative area, a lot of really old buildings and a lot of old Georgian architecture that's, it's beautiful, like truly. Um, and so, I don't know, I, uh, I think that it's always been there, that side, like the fact that music can make you imagine things that, you know, dream bigger, so to speak. And I always felt yeah. like that, that, that's every child's like, like right is to have that ability to imagine and dream and to become a reality. And I, I, uh, I definitely, you know, I definitely felt that. I definitely felt that growing up even prior to that mixtape. You know, my dad listened to a lot of the Moody Blues, Led Zeppelin and stuff. And then my mother listened to like Roy Orbison, Johnny Cash, and she would sing it in the house. So once I started to listen to my own music, like the punker stuff that I first heard, I, I still heard that you know, in Led Zeppelin and the Moody Blues style of thing where I just felt like maybe this was a little more like related to skateboarding, the specific thing that I was doing. But my dad still did listen to that heavy rock, which probably had a, 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 a as big or more of an influence. And my mother listening to Roy Orbison and Johnny Cash. And, you know, a lot of the music I listened to, you know, rock and roll and a lot of like the old kind of country style stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm crossing that all over into kind of 60s Mersey beat stuff through the Beatles and through the cross, cross the water to Discord. You know, that's what I like on the East Coast and across to the West Coast to all like the Minutemen and stuff like that. Like, yeah. I think it's specific, you know, like once I started to see Eric dress and skate or a skater from like the West Coast that was raw and see the, the music that came from there, it fitted. Like if you wanted to skate like that or learn to skate like that to listen to that kind of music. So I think that like the Descendants and the Black Flag and Dinosaur Jr. and Sonic Youth, who, like, they all skated pretty much. And, yeah. and Henry Rollins, and you'd always see them. There was always a board in the background somewhere. So it was more, I think there was more of a, you know, related more to that kind of, like, different thinker or maybe somebody that didn't always follow, follow the sheep, you know, which is what a skater is. And I think, so... You know, a lot of the music that I listen to definitely, or I've had in my video parts, it has to have that back end of authenticity. Here we go with our friends at rockabilly.com. I don't care whether you are into metal, rap, punk, pop, classic rock, or just pop culture stuff in general. You will find something you will like at rockabilly.com. And on top of that, I am giving you 10% off your entire order when you use the promo code 100 words or less. That cashes you in to a cool discount, like I said, 10% off. But you can find so many things. Like they've recently just posted some of their, uh, they participated in the Minneapolis State Fair and they did these really cool limited edition shirts of gigs that bands like Guns N' Roses, Rolling Stones, Pantera, Kiss all participated in the Minneapolis area and they recreated some of these shirts. But that's just a small sampling of the over half a million items they have, all officially licensed. Bands get paid from this. That's very important. None of this bootleg stuff. Because after all, bands live off of merch straight up. So use the promo code 100 words or less. Go to rockabilly.com, poke around, have fun, and enjoy ordering some merch. Hey, it's Ray, the host of this very podcast. And let me ask you a question. 
What if you had insights into your genetics that could help empower you to live healthier? How would you use that knowledge? You can hear me talk about insights from my DNA that have affected my personal health journey on this season of the podcast Spit from iHeartRadio and 23andMe. Host Baratunde Thurston, which by the way, incredible dude, has a podcast called How to Citizen. I can't highly recommend that any more than I am right now, but listen to that and listen to this podcast. But he explores how more and more people are finding out that DNA is about more than just ancestry. It's a key to understanding your health. Your genetic profile can tell you if you are at an increased likelihood for developing a particular condition. It's knowledge that can help you make smarter choices about your health and your lifestyle. On this season of Spit, you'll hear me and 22 other podcasters and influencers discuss what genetics revealed about our health and how that knowledge can impact the way we live our lives. Listen to my episode out now on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. As you started to, you know, get further into, you know, music and skateboarding and these things that were very counterculture for not only your area, but probably a lot of what your peers were getting into. Uh, I know your parents were supportive to a certain extent of your skateboarding, but were they ever, uh, I guess, concerned where I was like, what's this uh, loud music that Jeff is listening to? And (laughs) it was, you know, because I watched them all, all of them. So you never knew what was going to be on there. There could be like an early, you know, public enemy track out of nowhere. You, you never knew. So there was definitely those songs and video parts that I'd be playing in my house where my mother would be going, no, you, I'm not having that one. You need to go on to the next one. Play that one with the dude like Carl's down the hill. I like that one. Um, she always used to like me to play this one part in the old Santa Cruz video where Rob Roscoff's kind of like carving down this hill because she thought he was handsome and she liked to listen to the music because it was more surfy. You know? Right. <laughs> my parents, honestly, they've always been pretty pretty open like that where they – they weren't judgmental. They they definitely would question question it, you know, but they weren't they didn't make you stop things because they didn't like the sound of it. And I had friends that had that issue where they would play the music and they'd get their, you know, records broken or taken. You know, my friend would get his, his skateboard, you know, burnt on the fire or, or, or hidden in the in, in the garage, locked away where he couldn't find it, um, because his mother didn't want him to skateboard. But my I, I, total blessing you know for me is like i grew up with beautiful parents and they honestly they gave me that opportunity to make those decisions for myself you know no right yeah Yeah. that i I mean i think you're fans of music themselves i think and they might have had very musical tastes so they weren't as like immediately like against and, and my dad also liked really heavy rock so you think like when punk came in and then punk to more like grind and harder stuff, you know, when all the carcass and napalm death stuff started to come in, or like that kind of music. Like that was hard to get a hold of as well. You had to really know how to find it. And so there wasn't as much of that being played at my house because I was, when I was really getting into music, would have been like, you know, 88, 87, 88, 89, like somewhere around about there. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, so it would have been like the punk stuff, like the Sex Pistols stuff. I don't think my parents were really like turned their nose up, but I think they kind of understood that it was an extension from like rock and roll and into more like heavy kind of motorheady style stuff and into that punk stuff. They understood that side of it, I think, you know. Right, right. I mean, they had me for a son as well. Let's not forget that too. And I definitely was a little, you know, a, a traditional boy. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, was, I was definitely just not necessarily I wasn't a troubling kid but I was definitely uh, a boy very energetic let's put it that way right yeah. into, into loads of little fights and scraps and you know and that kind of thing and trying to climb trees and getting lost and, and stuff like that. <laughs> sure <laughs> jumping out of trees and a nail goes through your foot and you can't get the like plank of wood off the bottom of your shoe and you're like half a mile from the house that's me that was me growing up right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dennis, but the English Dennis the Menace, if you want to uh, search that one, the original Dennis the Menace. Right. Yeah. So you, there, there's a general air of mischief that happens with yeah, uh, boys. Like a, kind of a little shit more, more than mischief. I think that's the best <laughs> Because I yeah. think that was what I, I recall being called. And so uh, probably true. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, you're like, I, I I see it and I understand it in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, l- like you said, in the the fact that you know Liverpool is always such a musical town, and I know you had uh, you know a club like Planet X, which was so instrumental for the you know the goth scene, and I know that it's still uh, not only in operation, but a lot of people you know put that venue up there in regards to places like CBGBs and that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, were so you had an exposure to subculture stuff, but were many of your peers into it or was it you and just like a real small handful of people that were uh, into, you know, more independent minded stuff? Well, once I first started going into the city of Liverpool and going to the first skate shop, the first skate shop was in a record shop called Probe Records, which is a, actually has a history in itself. If you look at Probe Records in Liverpool, well, right, Probe Records was about two doors away from the original cavern where the Beatles played. You know, and so we're going into our first skate shop. We get our first skateboard. We're looking at records everywhere, and we buy the board. And the first place we're skating is the alleyway in front of the, you know, the, the cavern. Yep. <laughs> you know where the Beatles played, and so it's and you're doing fifty fifties on the curb in the entrance that goes down to where they played, and uh, that was like the first skate shop in in the city. You know, that was the first skate shop in this in the city of uh, of Liverpool. Mm-hmm. And and so was it was it mostly you know what I was getting to yeah, was yeah. It, then I, I, you know a few weeks after going into the city, you start exploring like a little bit further down the alleyway, you know, down the road, whatever. Well, then a skate shop opened up, and it was called Off the Wall a Skate Shop. Funnily enough, the tagline of Vans it was called Off the Wall. And there was a local pro skater in the city of Liverpool named Neil Downs, and he's still a, a legendary skater and still in the city. Well, he, op- he opened up a skate shop uh, in this place called Quiggins, which was this old historical building um, in the alleyways. Well, the Planet X was behind that. And so when that store opened up a few months after I started skating and we'd be in the alleyway behind that, well, towards the end of the day, the guys that I was starting to skate with they were going, hey, we're going to go and see this band play or this band play, you know? And and they'd start to go round the alleyway away from me. And I was so young and little, I was scared to go and try and get into a bar when I was, no joke, I was probably four foot, set, four foot eight inches and like 13 years old and my balls hadn't dropped and I was a child. Um, so I would skate the curbs around the corner, you know, outside while they'd go to the music venue. And I would hear all these stories of what was going on inside of the Planet X, you know. But I know mm-hmm. it's a ton of incredible bands played in there. But also, you know, a lot of the skaters from the local Liverpool scene, like Robbie Reed, who then went on to manage the local skate shop and run the local skate shop. He was in a band called Jail Cell Recipes. Um, and they would play in Planet X. And Robbie was, a you know, put on a lot of those gigs and was very instrumental, along with a lot of, the rest of the guys that I grew up with in that area, you know, in, in just really being part of that scene, you know, and I know it's huge, tons of bands played in uh, over the years, you know, I know John Lydon went in there before and other, other people, Morrissey had gone in there, um, but tons of bands played there, right? You yeah. Know, oh, absolutely. New, Boo Radley's. Yeah. You know? No, there's, yeah. there's def- definitely a lot. And, as you started to become more in love with a lot of these, you know, like you mentioned all the discord bands, et cetera, et cetera. Did you ever want to play in a band (laughs) or did you ever like pick up a guitar or like have that desire as well as you were pursuing all of your, you know, skating stuff? You know, I like screaming. I like writing. I like writing. I've always liked reading lyrics and I read a lot, like read a lot of books. Always have since I was a kid. Okay. Um, and uh, I like writing, and I've always drawn, drawn sketch little drawings and everything like that. Um, so I did for a little while play with a pro skater named David Gonzalez, uh, who is a Colombian skateboarder, incredible skateboarder from South America. Uh, we played in a band. He had a band called Rap Black, and uh, I played with him for maybe a year and a half. We would just jam. I think we recorded maybe maybe five or six songs we recorded, you know, and uh, we made one music video. And it was all just freestyle. We just went in there, had a couple of beers, and 
played in a studio and just I would take a piece of paper and pens and we would just start we would just start writing and reading. I did that maybe maybe seven or eight, six or seven years ago for a little while for fun. Okay. And that was sheerly just for the fun of it. Because yeah, I mean I I've always liked the idea of of not necessarily I don't like the idea of singing in front of people, but I like the idea of like self expression or a way to get energy out creatively. Um, I feel like skating and is, is like that. People watch skate videos and they get all fired up and they go skate themselves, same as people listen to music and they go and do things that helps them get in the frame of mind or helps them give them the balls to get it done. Right, absolutely. And the ideas behind you know skating and DIY, punk and hardcore are very similar in regards to you know, not asking permission and forging your own path. As you started to really dive into the skating universe and, you know, going pro and sponsors and all that sort of stuff, uh, was there ever any fear on your part to go down that road? Or was it very much just like, whatever, I got to try this because, you know, I enjoy it so much? Can you say that again? Yeah, it's okay. Was there was there any, um, you know, fear in diving into the whole you know, pro skater scenario, just because you, um, you know, there, there's no safety net in regards to that. I was terrified to have nothing and and everything that you wanted probably in life that you dreamed and hoped would happen to you, which you wanted to be a skateboarder. If you thought that that was a possibility, I I just always hoped that that would happen. And once it started to pick up, you know, I found a way to do it in a way that it worked for me, I suppose. And, uh, I've always been thankful for that. And the longer and longer I've done it, I realized that, you know, I think some of it's the way that you look at it and the way that you handle it rather than it being this big thing that you do. It's, you know, it's, it's like the business side of it's just that, but the act of skateboarding is priceless. And so, you know, it will always be what it will be to me. I was never been afraid to be a professional. No, I've, I can, I think that, like the professionals that came before me, the influence that they had on me was life changing. You know, even just the creative influence of professional skateboarders like Mark Gonzalez or guys that would paint and they would draw their own graphics. And you knew they grew, drew their own graphics because they'd write their name on them and stuff like that. And they'd have interviews and they'd write all of their own text in their interviews and things. And so, you know, when you see that happening and you see the extension of that where you have like a Spike Jones that goes on from making incredible music videos into making massive blockbuster movies and him being sought after as a creative mind in that realm and you realize he came from being a skateboard photographer and a skateboarder and you know, have a ton of other friends that have had those different trajectories through those avenues, you know, and, uh, and that... Uh, that you realize that it's not a bad path. It's not a bad influence to have that, like, art, you know, music and skate, surf, snow, BMX kind of culture all entwined. I do think it's very beneficial to, it's, it's you know, music's an ever-changing thing and an ever-evolving thing. And a lot of the sports that, like, I'm around or involved with, um, they're newer, you know, some of them. You know, aside from all the outdoor stuff I do, um, but this action sports and skate and surf industry, it's young. And so a lot of music has came hand in hand with that development and that growth of, of, of just the, the culture, you know, that we're all surrounded by in the cities, you know, and even now exposed to with all the digital exposure we have to sound, you know, like you see in a lot of like just recycling of, of things. And uh, I think some of it's pretty cool. I see, I see a lot of kids right now, like wearing like a lot of heavy metal and rock, heavy rock and roll shirts and stuff again. And um, I think they're relearning, you know, and uh, I think that's good. And I think people like John Lydon who are still out there, you know, very clearly loving making music, but in the same time being an entertainer and just writing books and doing other creative things. I don't know if you've seen that pill kind of book set that they've just put out. I did. Yeah. Like it looks incredible. For example, you know, um, yeah, very inf- influential even to me to see that, and uh, you know. So I just I don't know. That's how I feel about it, and I feel in skating at the where I'm at. I'm like I'm not a kid anymore, and I've made videos since I was a little kid. My whole life, I don't have anything to prove to anything uh, other than myself and myself 
the only limitations I have are physical. You know, my mental yeah. limitations and my imagination. I challenge it every single day to think differently and to help the community grow and and uh, I do I really do and I love keeping it to, keeping it together like if a guy like me doesn't choose to have a cheesy punk band in his video part and he chooses to use a band from 25 years ago and and all of a sudden people a big amount of people are exposed to that or even one person is exposed to that that's awesome that could have been me when I was 16 years old and it was <laughs> you know yeah right so, like that's very easy for me to do the right thing if I if I keep my moral compass and my ethics at least a little bit on the radar, you know. Um, but then the yep. influence he had on me too. Like I mean, the first CD I ever had was the Sex Pistols. Never mind the bollocks. Like all the visual side of like the Sex Pistols, I love that kind of punk DIY style because I watched my father print that kind of stuff himself with his big like letterpress, big huge printing presses. All those color separations with the ruby list, like they do back then. Like my father used to do all those. So seeing all of that punk DIY stuff done well, like I did that. That was like always fired me up, you know. And uh, yeah, same with me and Lemmy. Like when I was younger, like I think 1996, maybe in Europe, I was at a skate contest, and and. Uh, and there wasn't that many people in. Everyone was practicing in the morning, and there was somebody on the sidelines, and it was Lemmy, right? Like, and I remember just skating over to him, going, "What's going on, man? What are you doing in here?" Nobody was around, and he told me he was playing a gig in the next room that night or the next night or something, and that we should come to it, like that. That's what he said. And I'm like, "What are you doing in here?" He's like, "I just wanted to see what the skateboard and stuff looked like because they told me there was skateboarding in this room, so I came to look." And uh, so I said, so cool. yeah, I said hello to him and then I went blah, blah, blah. And then I went and watched him like two nights later or that night. And I think he was playing with, uh, I think Kid Rock opened up for him, no joke. So I, I went, <laughs> with, this is true. I went with Bam Margera, Bam and I went because we wanted to go be right up front on Kid Rock because we wanted to just have a blast and probably get drunk and have a good time. But um, so we went and just headbanged right up, right up against Kid Rock. And then we went and watched a motorhead play in the next room and uh, but the influence that somebody so pleasant you know that was just so down to earth approachable looked exactly like lemmy would look you know big probably big old glasses and like denim jacket or something I remember and this big old cowboy hat on um so you'd think he'd be intimidating until he opened his mouth or and like those kind of meetings, like I don't know, they they stick with me because those are my idols and heroes, and I don't want to be an ass wipe. So I really do try to leave a positive impact, and I do like to use different music or explore that. And uh, yeah, that's that, that. No, that's awesome. I appreciate you walking through all of you know how how that connects together, and I, I know that because of you know all the bands that you uh, have spoken of and the bands that you are a big fan of there are a lot of these counterculture thought processes in regards to you know whether it's like straight edge veganism and vegetarianism like all of the you know political beliefs um and i know that stuff impacted you as well just as far as you know getting exposed to it what what attracted you to that side of the music as well? Was it just the fact that there were these ideas that you had never heard before being presented, you know, with these bands? Absolutely. Self-exploration, you know, self Like I said, I always read the lyrics. So I was always interested in the viewpoint. So if I was listening to the music or playing the music or even skating to the music, it might have mean I might have just been proposing whatever was playing there too. It didn't mean that was all about that, if you understand that mentality. Sometimes I think certain music and certain parts of music resonate, you know, and if you understand, like, I don't know, maybe the foundation of, of what the song's about or, I mean, that it's up to the artist to choose whether he puts it over his skating and stuff, right? I don't think it's a, like, I've always felt like that. I've always felt like that. I've always felt like, you know, that choice is specific to that particular moment and that particular project. A year later, maybe you might look at that and go, you know, maybe that didn't, you know, look look right, but I've always felt like that. And and absolutely like the 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 idea of like who are you? What are you? And when you're you know, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, all the way up to 
till the day that we die. Um, you, you know, if you're interested in human psychology and, you know, and, and that, I think a lot of that punk music and a lot of the, the, the hardcore music, it explores more of those emotions and more of those feelings. And I think, especially in what we grew up in, where people chose to sw- swallow down your own emotion and, and, and stick it under the, you know, under the rug. Um, I think that kind of music and listening to different, like I used to listen to Shelter. Remember that band, Shelter? Oh my gosh, I love them, yeah, yes. I used to like to, I, was, I didn't really like necessarily like their, their, their total viewpoint, but I really liked their energy and their style of music play and just the way that they wrote the lyrics. I thought they were an incredible band. Um, for example, but, but if you had said, was I all about what they're about? No, it wasn't at all. But that doesn't mean I can't go and watch them and appreciate them and go, wow, they're amazing at what they do and even listen to, the, to that viewpoint and have an open mind on others. Um, I've always felt like that about music. Um, you know, I've gone to all kinds of bands over the years that I don't, I'm not necessarily listening to ever again, even some of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, I yeah, it, it, I mean, you're, that, yeah. You know, certain, certain things resonate. I can tell you, I saw Neil Young and Elvis Costello play and Elvis Costello blew him away. And his voice was twice as powerful and strong and, and impactful, <laughs> you know, from that like experience. Um, you know, just uh, I have an open mind on music, like I have an open mind on art, on creativity. Yeah, you know, and I think somebody's viewpoint can change, and I think somebody can somebody's life can change, and then in turn that viewpoint can change. And I don't think that I think people can be very judgmental, just in general, uh, you know, and willing to to do that. And I think in music and skating and art and that kind of creative culture. Uh, I like to, I like to have just a big imagination, you know? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think to your point, the idea that, you know, you can watch certain bands, yeah, I mean, using shelter as an example, it's not like, I mean, some people the next day after seeing them would turn Hare Krishna and, you know, be a raw vegan or whatever, but (laughs) you, you can at least be exposed to that and take parts of what it is that that they have put forward and be like, yeah, I agree with some of this. I don't agree with, or I, I don't feel the need to integrate this within my life, but now I understand that exists and I understand why they're passionate about it. Yeah, and there's a certain amount of reinforcement with the daily lifestyle. We use music as much as we, you know, love it as well too, don't we? To like keep our keep our energy up, keep our confidence up, keep our mindset up. You know, I, I think, and I think at, at at those ages, the younger ages, you're you're much more like I think just questioning a lot, or at least I was, and the lifestyle I had when I was growing, you know, from eighteen all the way through to now, I've traveled my whole life whole life all over the place non-stop skating everywhere and so all of those plane rides all of those train rides all of those bus rides um, music's a way to self-reflect help self-reflect like Lungfish is is one of my favorite bands and if you were to tell me i could only take a few a few bands you know to a desert island away with me that would be one of the bands i would choose the discography of because i i, I find that for me personally, um, I've never ever found another band that sounds like them, and the 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 way that the music is is put together, I I feel is just so incredibly creative and unique and forward thinking and sideways thinking and just you know some some of the albums are really well written, some of the albums are just really out there, you know, or just more instrumental than lyrical and i use lungfish a lot for a lot of personal meditation a lot of personal kind of journeys where i you know need to get myself prepared for work at hand whether that's jumping across a 50 foot roof gap and hopefully not dying right Uh, i do use music to balance me out big time big 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 time and it helps to know that like when i play like a band like motorhead where I've had a relationship with, with the singer, with Lemmy, that when you hear him and you know the genuine voice behind you know, the music, it really helps you be a little more powerful than you were before. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe that. You know, and, it, and the impact it's had on me to meet those people and meet John Lydon and see the kind of people they are. Like I bumped into John Lydon a few times in the airport 
since I worked with him years ago. And uh, every time he's hilarious. I called his bodyguard the other week, Rambo, and talked to him for about an hour and a half. And uh, But that's the kind of people they are. You do good work with them and you're genuine. And, like, there's, there's a certain, I don't know, I mean, I know with John, like, I could just look at him straight away and understand like he's such an intelligent person and such a creative person. He should be just celebrated, you know? Uh, right. Real about it. Cause I think he's a musical genius. I think he's a, just a creative genius. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the way I feel about it. So I'm, I'm thankful for like that influence and though the, you know, some of that influence as well, like, cause the, the music I've been fortunate to be really stoked on all Sonic youth as well. I'm a big fan of like Thurston Moore music, but again, I don't always completely agree with his political stance and, you know, but I don't have a political stance. I'm talking about music here and like he writes right. incredible music and plays incredible music. And I'm a huge fan of the style of music that he's always played uh, along with all of the, the members of uh, Sonic Youth. And, and think about it. That was the first seat al- like al- uh, cassette tape I ever had. Right. I still listen to it right now. You know, I still listen to Black Flag. I still listen to Minor Threat. And I absolutely listen to, you know, Fugazi and Right to Spring and Longfish and, and Grey Matter as well. That's, again, Grey Matter is one of those bands like Dag Nasty that I feel like is, you know, they're special. They're great bands. They're incredible bands. Yeah, it's foundational for you. Yeah. And, and Dag Nasty during that time did play a big role. At that time, I was very sober. Like I didn't drink from when I was 18 till I was 22, 23 years old. And I was trying to find myself living in a foreign country uh-huh. and explore myself. And I do think that um, Dag Nasty during that period of time when, you know, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing any drugs of any kind, not to say that I'm doing that now because I'm, I'm not, but I'm just saying back then, like a lot of focus for people when they're 18 years old, 19 years old, that I was around every single night. It's like I'm living in an apartment with 10 guys and everyone's drinking and smoking weed and doing whatever the hell they want and do and going down that path. It was a way for me to go into the corner, listen to music and stay focused on my skating and not drink because I think at that period, if I did drink, um, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. You right. Know? Like I wouldn't have that strong, like, foundation of what's important i needed to protect that before i you know before i had my foundation set and there's a there's a clear example of mu- using music to help yourself get through a period yep um, so dag nasty absolutely i love evil greed merch what are they they are a berlin germany based merchandise company and mail order solution so a lot of different bands and record labels work with them to provide a very highly curated and custom web store solution, but you as the consumer can purchase merch from them and use this code 100 words that gets you 10% off of your entire order. And I love what they do because they work with a very select few bands and a very select few record labels. They essentially act like a record label, but let me just give you a little bit of sampling of some of the bands that they work with. They work with Deaf Heaven, Integrity, Incendiary, Sun, Full of Hell, Chelsea Wolf, and they also work with record labels like Triple B, Death Wish, Closed Casket Activities, Southern Lord, Sergeant House. You get it. Trust me, when you go to evilgreed.net, you will have a lot of fun looking at all of the cool and, like I said, highly curated web stores that they have there. And I know you hear Germany and you're like, oh my gosh, that's going to take forever to ship to me. False. It will ship to you very quickly. And that is why they forged a partnership with this particular podcast because they're like, hey, we ship pretty fast from Germany. Like, you know, I ordered something from them and in less than a week, they got it to me. So I'm not going to say that that is like everybody's experience, but that is a very, very cool thing. So go to evilgreed.net and use the promo code 100 words and get you 10% off your order. Thank you very much, Evil Greed. Hey, it's Ray, the host of this very podcast. And let me ask you a question. What if you had insights into your genetics that could help empower you to live healthier? How would you use that knowledge? You can hear me talk about insights from my DNA that have affected my personal health journey on this season of the podcast Spit from iHeartRadio and 23andMe. Host Baratunde Thurston, which by the way, incredible dude, has a podcast called How to Citizen. I can't highly recommend that any more than I am right now, but listen to that and listen to this podcast. But 
He explores how more and more people are finding out that DNA is about more than just ancestry. It's a key to understanding your health. Your genetic profile can tell you if you are at an increased likelihood for developing a particular condition. It's knowledge that can help you make smarter choices about your health and your lifestyle. On this season of Spit, you'll hear me and 22 other podcasters and influencers discuss what genetics revealed about our health and how that knowledge can impact the way we live our lives. Listen to my episode out now on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. On that idea, like I compare when people like yourself are, you know, like turning pro, getting sponsorships and, you know, working in the professional skate industry uh, as a very similar trajectory as when bands first start to work with a record label and a booking agent and all that sort of stuff. Did you, um, I mean, I know because you've navigated it for so long, did you enjoy, I guess, the business side of things? Or was that just something you obviously had to kind of take a part of in order to, you know, make a living? I think it was trial and error. Okay. Uh, I think I was fortunate to be privy to a father who did part of like a manufacturing process. So I think I understood a little bit of the homegrown side of the skate industry when I saw it, where I don't think I was, I was like demanding, if that makes any sense. So I was realistic about what when money started to come in uh, with it and that. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Right, you you interacted with it as much as you needed to because that's obviously an important part of how you can you know grow as a human. But it wasn't something. I also grabbed it by the balls. Okay, <laughs> I also did grab it by the balls, and I did wrangle it quite a lot. And there was a lot of like alligator wrestling, you know, sure, and, and backroom kind of uh, rustling, so to speak. But no, honestly, um, I would definitely say that. Uh, once I was clear, like I was been always been a pretty loyal to the people I've worked with, like on the brands that I've been partnered with. I haven't been a person that really did bounce around much over the years. And so, you know, I was always focused on building relationships as much as I was focused on making sure that I was being paid to do some work, you know? And like, I didn't treat my skating as work. I treat my skating as priceless and like, there's no money. Like you could offer me ten thousand dollars to do the biggest handrail in the world back then, and I would have laughed it and said, "Go away! I'll send you the video in the morning." Right. <laughs> or like you would turn around and I would just do it in front of you. That was my motivation. I was like, I always grew up with people that skated like that, you know, and I was always inspired by that like spontaneity because we were always like that growing up in our local skate scene. We had a great skate scene. Everyone was always pushing each other to go. Oh, you should ollie that gap. No, you can do it. There would always be one of us at try and slam. Um, you know, so I've got a lot to be thankful for as well, too. You know, like it, it, the people you surround yourself with that, you know, that says a lot about who you are. And it's not yep. always about money. It's about people. And every brand that I've ever been with and every person I've ever been partnered with, whether it's a company or individual, it's always been about that first and foremost. Do I like this person? Do I want to work with this person? Are we thinking the same way? Do we have the same goals? And uh, when those goals change, then sometimes you have to take a pay cut. Sometimes you haven't got a job. And so that's easy to say, right? But that's the moral compass of, you know, once I got a strong partnership with like Vans and Vulcan brands early on and i'm not with Volcom anymore but i'm using them as an example because i was with them for 19 years right and it was about the people and they're a great brand and uh and so i've always based all of those deals on you know uh do i want to work with that brand do i believe in and, and as well with the product kind of it do i use the product you know do i use the product and do i believe in the product or do i believe in what they're always trying to achieve with their product um, that was always important to me as much as like getting paid well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I did, I did have to push quite a few times in some situations, you know, to make sure that the, the bigger picture was handled. And a lot of the times that was for the benefit. Well, it was always mutually beneficial as a thought process, right? It was never something, what can I get from somewhere and then leave it burning? quite the opposite if i saw a problem that needed to be fixed that needed a, a little bit more of a stronger stance to make sure it didn't happen to protect everybody 
sometimes I did try to be more of a, a, a bigger team player um, uh, than, especially than your average pro skateboarder. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And when you started to uh, build your community as far as, you know, other skaters you were friends with, and once you moved over to the States and really started to, you know, meet a lot of people. And I know there is a large intersection of professional skaters that have a punk and hardcore background. Did did you feel that was common or was were a lot of people coming from sort of different different musical styles? Well, I moved to Huntington Beach, California uh, on July 2nd, 1994. Now, mm-hmm. imagine me skating in the back alleyway behind the Planet X in Liverpool, which looks like San Francisco in the Northwest England kind of scenario. Imagine that. Imagine then fly, getting on a plane the next day, flying all the way to Orange County, you know, to Huntington Beach, to where, you know, the main music style is punk you know right (laughs) that was pretty easy for me to i think relate to a lot of a lot of the local skaters a lot of people in the area just in general even if i like felt nervous to talk to somebody i still felt like well it's still a little punky around here and like it might be green day and it might be the offspring you know (laughs) it's not it's not the sex pistols and freaking you know discharge or something but um you know, so I did. I do think I did relate to Orange County. I did, and I think that that was helpful in like me not feeling like a tool. And and some of the music did play a role in that for sure. Right. But, you know, and, and part of the you know part of the process of obviously being a professional skater is like you mentioned the the travel, and so much of that is connected to what bands experience as well. Did you, as you started to get out there and tour and do all of the um, activities that you took a part in, did you like touring or was that something you had to get used to? Um, I liked, I did like touring. Yeah, I did. I've always liked to be on an adventure. Um, I I grew up taking trains and buses into the city and all over England to contests from the second that my parents would let me leave the house. Um, so I've traveled all over Europe before I'd even came here. And so my goal, like coming to the U S is I wanted to skate everything. I wanted to skate all of the crazy spots in California, Southern California. I wanted to go to San Francisco and bomb the biggest hill. I wanted to go to New York and freaking, you know, I wanted to go to Philly. I wanted to experience a lot of that. Um, but at times like the contests that were in the middle of those things where you felt obliged to go to these things where you were going to maybe a small town, like, in Rhode Island or somewhere where the, there wasn't really more of a different culture <laughs> back then. Right. Maybe they had never really seen skating because, you know, the big skate contest that, you know, that they'd started in the late nineties, there, so there was a period there where they didn't exist. And uh, so when all of that started to pop back up again and we were traveling to the first X games and, you know, doing tours, our tours would be just like the bands we'd do like 60 day tours with like 50 demos and skating's pretty physical, if you think about it. And we yeah. used to drive like all night. Like um, I remember going on tours for months on end early on, and I loved it. I really did. But I will say, answer your question, yeah, some of the contests, they suck balls. I didn't want to go to them. Right. So I'd go to them and go, you know what? I don't even want to skate today because it's just – you walk out there and the guy on security doesn't skate. He wants to shove you. He's telling you you need to stand over the – the cameraman's telling you, screaming at you when it's time for you to drop in on the ramp like they used to at the first two X Games. And uh, so it's not that fun if you're a, a guy that feeds off, like, real, honest street skating. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you're like, this doesn't feel like this at all. <laughs> you know, go in the hamster cage right now. We're going to put our corporate logos over everything. Drop in on the ramp. We're going to record you, and we're going to sell you. You know? And so... You know, like I, I would be the guy who would look at them and wait till they said, you want me to go now? 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 I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm gonna go the way. I love doing that. Like, and when I would do demos, every demo I would do, a lot of them, I would, I would skate the perimeter of the crowd like for a long time, just go around to build up my speed, like a whole perimeter of the outside of the crowd. And I start power sliding in areas where like, I felt like, hey, you need to move back right there. I would do this for a while and that's how I warmed up. And it was a fun way to like use the crowd as like an obstacle, like you were skating down the street or like they were in the way and that you wanted to just skate around them. Like I would skate a lot like that at demos and places. And uh, that helped 
that helped make it feel comfortable. Yeah. And there's a lot of times you'd skate around the edge and somebody would say hello and you'd say hello and they were genuine. And then a lot of times you'd skate along the edge, much like in a, you know, if you were playing in a band with somebody would heckle you, they'd, you'd skate past and somebody would go, oh, dude, he's not very tall, is he? Or you'd hear you'd go past the next guy and you'd say, <laughs> show, show me this, do this or something. And the next guy, like, literally stop you, get in front of your way and, like, try to stop your skating so they could bother you and stuff like that. So I enjoyed the interaction and, you know, in turn, like, it got, it was, it was pretty cool to get to know and get to just interact with a lot of the skate scenes across the country and just as a kid looking back like yeah, it was nice to be in Kansas in the middle of the summer just getting loads of mosquito bites and doing a demo with like two jump ramps and a freaking flat bar or something like that and you know it builds character and right I yeah change it. I'd recommend everybody do the same I'd recommend anybody that's starting in a, in a small band or wants to play music just get on the road and spread it around because it's a good way to test the waters, to know what's out there, to know what might, you know what I mean? Like just to, just to, just to have an open mind on life in general. And yeah, experience, experience more, see outside of the things that you have previously experienced for sure. I I would be uh, remiss if I did not bring up the idea of, you know, your inclusion in the Tony Hawk pro skater video game, because uh, that is such a pop culture artifact and is still, you know, resonant to so many people, not only from a fun video game perspective, but I imagine it changed much of how people, you know, you became a household name at that point, not like you weren't before. Um, Did you, I'm going to guess that, you saw a distinct change in the way maybe people viewed you or interacted with your skating, or was it just kind of business as, as usual um, once that you know video game franchise became what it was? I think it was an incredibly positive influence on a whole demographic and just generation, multi-generational people that were exposed to skateboarding and the creativity of skateboarding from the graphics to the different like pro skaters choice clothing choices even Mm -hmm. and just the colors and the artwork on the boards and then the music which was very much mostly southern california ish style music which back then like in the early mid late 90s when you know it went right in tune with what skate culture was about but maybe this was like a way to connect with a little bit of a broader audience without being too cheesy. You know what the Tony Hawk Pro Skater did? It was a beautiful thing. Right in the edge of that edge where a lot of people are exposed to skateboarding in a positive way, like what Bam Margera's done and Rob Dierdek's done and Jackass has done for us and Jeff Tremaine has done for us and Rick Kosick uh, and even Sean Cliver and all of those guys. Um, that's what the Tony Hawk Pro Skater did for us. It exposed our industry and our lifestyle and everything we love to huge just generation of people and they loved it. Yeah. And so, you know, like the way that people interacted with you after that fact, no, I mean, I think it sets certain pros aside from, you know, uh, during that generation. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the people that were, you know, made that impact back then were, you know, the guys that were in that video game. And so it's the fact that it stands the test of time with who was chosen along with everything that it did, which was just create a whole new just quality of skateboarding game that didn't exist before and and influence a whole generation of people and kids to pick up a skateboard, to then find Bam Margera, to then find Rob Deerdeck, to then find Jackass. And all of those, the the skateboard interaction with all of those fringe, the edge kind of, you know, people or, or, you know, whatever it is, um, has had a positive impact for us. So I'm thankful on that, you know? Yeah. Well, and the, and to, to that point too, I mean, the soundtrack yeah, was so, like, yeah. they asked me like a lot of the people, you know, the guys in the game were asked what musical choices they wanted because they knew that we picked their own music in the videos and things like that. They were right. very, very good at like, trying to be reflective of all the little detail of the things so they could put it into the game to make it a real interactive game way ahead. Um, the amount of, amount of stuff that they did to make that happen uh, was huge. Um, yeah. And uh, two last things I wanted to hit on before I let you go was the idea that so much of the punk culture, especially in the you know 80s, not every band um, 
kind of aspire to this, but that whole live fast, die young. And I know a lot of that does bleed over into the skate community as well, especially with the, you know, danger and harm that you put your body through when you are a teenager and, you know, in your early twenties. Um, and you definitely went hard. <laughs> that is, that is, uh, on video and on record. Um, but it, it, to me, I mean, the fact that you obviously still exist in the community means you didn't travel too far down that road. Um, you know, talk to me about if you recognize that being, I guess, kind of pervasive within the skate culture where people really were just like, whatever, I don't care. I'm really nihilistic. Or am I just kind of uh, looking too far into it? Live to skate, skate or die. Um, like that mentality. Yep. Um, like that thrasher kind of mentality goes very much hand in hand with like heavier music and heavier that side. I, I love that, that style and that, that theme because it runs right in line with like board slide and concrete grind in a wall, which is quite abrasive, right? It doesn't have to be negative. It's just still abrasion, you know? Um, I don't want that to ever change. I don't want that to ever change. I will, I will say that. Um, but I will say this also. Rod Stewart, Forever Young, um, you know, the, that feeling of like, I want to be a kid forever. We're not a kid forever, really. Our bodies are going to just wilt away and die. So we're, we're not made of metal, we're made of flesh, but we fight concrete for a living. So I guess, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm getting to on that is uh, we have our limitations. I, re- I, I see my limitations, but I, I also... My goals are also as important as, you know, the physical limitations of what my body can handle, I suppose, also. Um, But I don't know. I broke a ton of bones. I've had so many surgeries. I just finished another video part. I'm having a PRP injection in my hip tomorrow. I split my whole left calf for about six inches and tore the back of my fascia on my left calf 12 weeks ago. Um, pretty much every skateboard video I've ever made, I've broke a bone. Um, I've had a surgery on both ankles, both knees, hips, hair, all kinds. Like I think I've broke over 10, 11 bones. Um, so, but I, but I definitely realized that at the age that I'm at, 46 years old, um, I need to be clever and smart because I have beautiful children, a beautiful partner, and uh, I can't make these gnarly street videos forever. Right. I, I will die doing it. Um, but so what I will say is this, it's not done. No, no, it's, it's all, it's all done out of you know, a lot of nothing's done foolishly. If that makes sense. Uh, I don't make, I don't take chances. I, I prepare a lot when I'm going to skate like brutal stuff. I make sure I can move and I'm in good strength. And I spend a hell of a lot of my time outside of skating, staying in shape. You know, I do about a hundred days of the year where I guide in the mountains uh, I guide in California up to 14,000 feet, so I'm going up and down, up and down elevation. Uh, so I work and train very hard to keep my lung capacity uh, and my stamina up so that when I skate, I can skate forever. Yeah, absolutely right. There's that idea that the preservation that you want to subject your body to <laughs> will be able to bleed over into all areas of your life and not just benefit skateboarding. It's like, oh yeah, all of this works together, hopefully. But Ray, I could have said that 15, 20 years ago and I'm still here now making skate videos and loving it. <laughs> right. Let me made music till the day he dropped. You know, yep. he played music till the day he dropped. You know? And and that wasn't foolish. You know, and it, it was a, uh, it was a beautiful thing. And, um, I'm not an idiot. I'm not somebody who's going to put myself at, at harm for no reason. Um, and so what that means is I just have to be stronger. I have to be sharper. I have to be nimbler, but most importantly, I have to be more wise and I have to really pick my battles. Yep. You know? Makes total it's sense. For me so far. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. When it doesn't. Boom. There's the gambler that the gambler will come out. Yep. Totally get that. And the, the, the fact that, I mean, like you mentioned that you are, uh, you know, doing a lot of different things in regards to, you know, running your outdoor company, obviously running your own skate company, doing the, uh, you know, I guess mountaineering as you would call it in the guides. Um, you know, you're running a few different companies. Uh, I, I'm guessing that you 
enjoy the creative aspect in all of those, but there's a business thing that's attached to it as well. Um, do you kind of enjoy the holistic nature of it or do you just like the fact that you can have fun with these different businesses? No, a lot of the back end of the room, those businesses is a pain in the ass and it's a constant uh, thorn in the side to make sure all of those businesses are just the foundations are set and all of the day-to-day logistics and runnings of those business go smoothly. Uh, and over the years, you find certain things about, you know, a business or, you know, the whole circle of making product or branding or marketing or whatever aspect of it it is. You find out the things that you, you feel more confident in and the things that you feel like you need help in or things that you feel like you can do and you don't want to do. Um, so I'd say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a balance. It really is. I love the creative side of it, the product side of it, the graphic, the stuff that everybody sees that side of it. Um, all that side of it, I, I feel very confident in that. And so I, I very much enjoy the creative process of all of it. We have a whole collection coming out with Motorhead um, this year, a whole b- to load of skateboards, a load of van shoes, a load of Freedom skateboards, a load of Rolly Motorhead skateboards. And I've just, I've enjoyed doing that, man, because that, again, that's personal. And we did a Lemmy tribute skateboard that you can buy that will go on the wall. So when it's stuff like that, I mean, what well, I mean, that's what I, you dream of as a kid. I want to be in the skate industry. I want to make skateboards. I want to make skate shoes. I want to, you know, work with the people that are, you know, idols or, or just live the dream. And I feel like I'm living the dream every single day, and I don't ever forget that. And, you know, not a second goes by that I don't give thanks, truly, um, you know, to it. Um, but the, 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 out, the creative output as a workload is immense, but that's not that doesn't bother me. It's times when the back ends of the business kind of all intersect at days when you're not available. Uh, like for example, when I'm traveling, or if I ha- happen to be away from service for five days, and there's something that's pressing that has to be handled right there and then, and that's when it creates issues and the, the back end. And uh, the best thing I can say on that is uh, less is more. Right. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm finding the things that I that I'm confident in that I enjoy, and I'm. And the things that are not working for me, I have no problem putting those aside. Uh, your ego is not your amigo, to quote Tony Alva, who is the most total badass skateboarder that ever lived. Um, but yeah, so I, I feel like that about business, honestly. Like you win some, you lose some. Success can consist of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And uh, I just always remind myself that like I'm fortunate and like the fact that we can wake up every day and you know, live the life that we want to live. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not to be taken for granted. And I do, it, 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 it makes me show up, you know, to remind yeah. me of those things. And, uh, and when you're reminded of that and you see it reflected in, in, especially in music, you see it so much reflected in music because music has a pretty hardcore trajectory in life, hasn't it? Like especially rock and roll leading into metal and core and, you know, everything it's, you know, there's a lot of angst going on there, right? There's a lot of emotion. Um, yep. Like skateboarding, like our, all of our heroes and our idols that we grew up with, we've been losing them, you know? And it's a young sport. It's only been around since the 70s. So there are people that, like, it, they, it really hurts your heart when, when, when we lose another, you know? And we're starting to see a lot of that ha- happen through. And uh, it, it reminds me to be a good person, to be a good influence and, yeah. Play yeah. Music, play music fast and loud. Right. Well, I, I, I promise this will be the last thing. I'm just going to put you on the spot in regards to because you've espoused your love for uh, Discord. If you would uh, name your, you know, your three top Discord releases, uh, they don't necessarily need to be all time. But, you know, because I'm putting you on the spot, what would you uh, what would you say your uh, top three are there? That's easy. I would say the first minor threat, first Fugazi. So it was the 13 songs. Yeah, the most minor threat was, and then Longfish. Let me see the computer. There you go. Got um, it. That was their album. That was the name of the album, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that album. There you go. Yeah. No, I, I I love it. Well, Jeff, you've been great. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you letting me ping pong around your brain. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day, and uh, hopefully, we'll get to talk sooner and later. Oh my, what a big conversation and what a good one. I just 
when I'm editing and listening back to these conversations, because, you know, sometimes I record them and then I don't visit them until, you know, maybe a month or so after I've tracked them. And uh, I'm just like, oh, this is really good. (laughs) And it's not for me. It's obviously from the discussion that people have in relation to the questions that I pose and then just the different ways that they, uh, they go about it. So anyways, big shout out to Jeff Rowley. Big shout out to Andrew Cannon for connecting us. And uh, yeah, I just love it when guests of the show recommend this particular guest appearance for others because it's like, hey, you know what? I enjoyed this and I think you would as well. So next week, I have a really fun conversation with a, uh, you know, internet friend <laughs> turned real life friend. I mean, I haven't met him in person, but um, yeah, I just think that when we do meet, it will be a, a real life friendship. His name is Bjorn Dashe. And I'm totally butchering his last name, I can already guarantee that. But he is the vocalist from Rise and Fall, and he also currently plays in a band called Chain Reaction. Rise and Fall loomed very large in my life. I absolutely adored the band in the uh, you know 2010s, I guess. That's roughly when they started to kick around and make, make some noise, so to speak. But uh, yeah, Rise and Fall... Swedish hardcore, loved the band, loved what they were doing, and uh, got connected via some mutual friends. And then here we were talking about Swedish hardcore. (laughs) And I recorded that conversation. So that's what we got next week. And uh, until then, please be safe, everybody. 13 days of Halloween, Devil's Night. Do not leave your house. Do not answer the door if you hear a bump in the night. Do not go investigate. Season three of the horror fiction podcast presented in immersive 3D audio. Ah! Oh my God, he's going to get left behind. <laughs> he's going to spend the night out here. Starring Carter Rockwood. Are you kidding me? You know what night it is? Do you hear the radio? And Clancy Brown. There are things in the night that would love to get their bony hands on a boy like you. Listen to 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's Roy Wood Jr., host of The Daily Show podcast, Beyond the Scenes, and we are back for season two. Beyond the Scenes is the podcast where we take the topics and segments that were on The Daily Show and give them a little more love. This season, we're bringing back more Daily Show writers, producers, and correspondents, more experts, giving us some extra knowledge you can't get anywhere else. Don't miss it. Listen to Beyond the Scenes on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The world of chocolate has been turned upside down. A very unusual situation. You saw the stacks of cash in our office. Chocolate comes from the cacao tree. And recently, varieties of cacao, thought to have been lost centuries ago, were rediscovered in the Amazon. There is no chocolate on earth like this. Now some chocolate makers are racing deep into the jungle to find the next game-changing chocolate. And I'm coming along. Okay, that was a very large crocodile. Listen to Obsessions Wild Chocolate on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.